Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you. Talking About Marketing is a podcast for business owners and leaders produced by my dad, Steve Davis, and his colleague at Talked About Marketing, David Olney, in which they explore marketing through the lens of their own four Ps, person, principles, problems, and perspicacity. Yes, you heard that correctly. Apart from their love of words, they really love helping people. So they hope this podcast will become a trusted companion on your journey in business. David Olney, one of my favorite quotes I would like to read to you right now because it sets things up for our topic today. Are you ready? I am ready. I didn't want to interrupt your quote. <laughs> well, I wanted to give it the, the announcement that it was coming. I wanted to hear your eager anticipation. Okay, listeners, listen up. Here comes the quote. I have made this longer than usual because I've not had time to make it shorter. Beautiful. A lovely quote. Yes, reputedly and reportedly uh, Blaise Pascal, but there are many different variations of that saying throughout history. But it cuts to the chase of communicating without BS, I think, which we're coming to in the principles session today. And it's also the reason why we try to keep these podcasts to 30 minutes. It takes a bit more work, but it's better than just rambling on for an hour and a half. Because we do that after we've turned the microphones off. <laughs> so let's get underway. Otherwise, I'm about to undo all the virtuous good I've just set up. <laughs> Our four Ps. Number one, person. The aim of life is self-development. To realise one's nature perfectly. That is what each of us is here for. Oscar Wilde. For the person segment today, David, I want to um, play a little snippet from a podcast which I quite enjoy called the Small Business Big Marketing Podcast. Heartily recommend that to any of our listeners. Um, there was an episode recently, I think it was episode 601, in which... Tim had a guest, uh, Alfred Boyages, who is an industrial designer. He's also a motorbike rider. And on a fateful day back in 2013, he was riding along at night and too late, he noticed there was a big oil slick across the road. As you do, he tried to navigate that uh, but lost control of the bike, terrible injuries, lucky to be alive today. As it turns out, at the time the accident happened, he was doing his industrial design uh, training, study, and working on a prototype of um, some helmets for the police force. A uh, better helmet, a little bit of overlay of some information in there for them. And he thought, you know what? We have to take this further. We have to make this sort of thing available for all riders. Because if I had prior notice that this was coming, some sort of um, early alert uh, system, it would be much safer. And so he started a business, um, uh, Foresight, which is F-O-R-E-C-I-T-E. -E. I like that play on words. There is a huge cult following around this business now of these amazing, apparently, I haven't, I haven't played with one, amazing uh, helmets that give a motorbike rider lots of information that they need in small, simple doses to keep them safe on, on the road. And here's the reason I wanted to share this in the person segment, is that towards the end of the interview, Tim cheekily asks Alfred, he says, look, you must be making so much money now. Why are you not buying a Greek island and just retiring there? And what he said just resonated deeply with the kind of people we like working with. Let's have a listen to this snippet. 
I, I, I personally don't earn uh, a huge amount of money. I'm not the highest paid person in the company, and that's by choice. I'd rather take a slice of equity for my pay instead. Um, but uh, yeah, every every investment round, like all the last two, last three, um, I've, I've participated myself, um, which goes and shows a lot uh, to to shareholders. Um, but you know, I'm in it for the long haul. Um, I love doing this business. I get up every day and I'm thankful that I can go into the office and build this kind of stuff. So, you know, money, so as long as it's covered the bases, then I'm pretty happy. I find that really refreshing. He is so focused on his mission to make motorcycling safer that the, the rewards, they come of their own accord. And I've noticed a... A distinction between some of the people I meet in the mentoring between those who have a connection to a mission and those who just say to me, hey, I just want my business to be an ATM that spits out money. And it's really hard to work with business owners with that mindset because it's hard to build a connection between them and their ideal customers because Who's motivated to help somebody else just create a hole in the wall spitting out money? What do you think, David? It's something that immediately reminds me of when I was teaching complex problem solving. And I used to tell students about Viktor Frankl surviving Auschwitz and then writing Man's Search for Meaning. And he makes the point in the book that there's meaning in love, meaning in work, and meaning how you confront suffering. And that people do best when they've got all three kinds of meaning in their life but at a minimum, you at least need one kind of meaning in your life. And yeah, people who just think cash is the answer don't tend to resonate with everyone else who needs more meaning. And if all people are after is cash, it's really difficult for them to connect with people. They have to have something so valuable as a product that people can get past no connection simply because the product is so valuable. And I don't think we're in a world anymore where there's very many products or services that are so unique that we can't find an alternative if we don't connect with the person selling it. Yes, and I'm glad you mentioned Viktor Frankl's book because I wrote a blog post on that over the 2021-22 summer. I'll put a link in the show notes because uh, Peter Lesky, the Australian journalist who was jailed wrongfully in Egypt, put me onto the book. And particularly one aspect of its reading, which was uh, in looking for somewhere to anchor our sense of meaning, uh, Frankel, in Peter Lesky's words, said, well, you can look for it in yourself, but that doesn't seem to stand the test of time. You can look to it in a God, but it's really hard. It becomes quite abstract. It's finding that anchor within the community, within the people around you, that's where we have something that we can latch onto that's bigger than ourselves to give us that resilience and a focus where we can actually discern meaning. Mm. And that's, I think, why Frankel you know, had the first part of the book about there's meaning in love. And the classic example he gives in the book is a really terrible day where they're on a forced march from one camp to another or one camp to a work site. It's the depths of winter. He's very sick. He can barely stand up. He's got a friend on either side of him in the column of prisoners being marched. And he just thinks to himself, all I really want to do is just wander off onto the edge of the track here, put my face down in the snow. I know one of the guards will come and smash my skull in with a rifle butt, and then it will all end. And that will be so much nicer than today. And then it dawns on him, yeah, but if I do that, I've let my wife down. What if she's alive today and still fighting to be alive? So love for Frankel was the most critical thing to start finding meaning in. He thought probably the one that if you're only going to have one was the most important. Yeah. And that's why I wanted to raise it in our person segment because uh, all of us as business owners or leaders, uh, I, I guess my takeaway is how clear are you about a mission that drives you forward, that, that is seemingly calling you, if I can harken back to the hero's journey, what is it? that keeps the fire in your belly alive? If it's gone out, is there a way of just, you know, hovering over those holes and rekindling it, the coals, I mean, and rekindling it? Or is it time to find a different source of that inspiration? But certainly, if you have a chance to do some reflection, 
I think it pays itself, which is what Alfred Boyages discovered. Uh, the money follows when you are deeply connected to something that is a mission that is helping others. And that can be any type of business, uh, the way that can help from a, from a corner store to the uh, development of a, uh, a technical doodad that's going to keep you safe on the roads. So I hope you find that helpful. Our four Ps. Number two, principles. You can never be overdressed or overeducated. Oscar Wilde. So, David, whatever made you pick up a book entitled Writing Without BS? The author was the reason I picked it up. Josh Burnoff is probably one of the most interesting people writing about what's going on in modern business of the last 20 years and has I think now had five best-selling books. Really importantly, he wrote a book called Empowered in about 2010 about how much the business world had changed and how much customers had changed and how much about in a world of empowered customers, you have to empower your employees to be really creative and independent and to help people solve their problems. And out of that book, he realized that the old world of very complicated sales scripts, the world of very overcooked marketing rather than inbound marketing of helping people solve their problems, he found there was so much useless language and he just got sick of seeing useless language in business writing, in sales, in marketing and you know felt that he needed to write a book about writing without BS because people's attention spans now are shorter and there is so much information we can read and if you don't make your thing clear and short and purposeful quite simply it will be ignored and they will move on to the next thing to read hoping it's more relevant more interesting and brief sorry what were you saying no i'm only joking um with josh in his writing on this does he give any uh ready reckoners any heuristics any rules of thumb for doing a self-assessment as to whether or not you are just fluffing out and padding out what you're doing in your communication. He has what he calls his iron rule, and his iron rule is the person reading whatever you write, their time is more valuable than yours. If you don't write from that premise, they will ignore you as being irrelevant and not treating them with care. Which is what that Blaise Pascal quote was really cutting to the chase with. You know, I, I'm writing you a long letter because I don't have time to write you a short one. And that just shows the the lack of care to to reel off a 700-page email when a seven-sentence email could have done the job. Yeah, and that's very much his point is always leave time, if you possibly can, to edit. Because we've all been habituated through school and university to the wrong way of writing. We write fluffy introductions that don't go very far. We then write three to five you know, uh, topic paragraphs to build an argument. And then at the end, just before the conclusion, we get to the point and then we can recapitulate the point by which time the average person is bored out of their mind, gone to sleep or given up. So his argument, this all has to be turned on its head. And he's very much suggesting a writing style along the line of Barbara Minto's pyramid principle where you set out the relevant question, the relevant answer, three short reasons for the answer, and tell people, look, can give you more information if you need and want it, but don't want to waste your time. Which is actually interesting use of the pyramid uh, terminology there, because I was harking back to my days as a journalist, uh, which I bring to the blogging workshops I run, and that of the inverted pyramid, which is mm. the model we use in journalism where you hit us right between the eyes with the key point and then you backfill the background and people can mm. leave the story whenever they've uh, got enough from it mm. and burnoff is really taking that path as well but unlike a journalist he's going is that an unnecessary adjective is that adjective there, there to desperately capture people or is it actually adding value and his argument is that the majority of adjectives aren't adding any real value. Right. So he doesn't like adjectives or description words. No, because if what you're talking about matters enough, it should stick. 
He says, if you need one word to make what something is clear, fine, but there shouldn't ever be two. So what should our listener take away from this, David, uh, for the very next email they write or letter or talk? I think probably three things. First of all, remember his iron rule, that the person reading its time is more valuable than yours. That way you've got a better chance of writing it the right way. Also, what does that person need to know immediately to make a good decision or to understand? That should be first. And third of all, uh, don't waste words trying to be clever because what will make you look clever is if someone gets what they need and goes, wow, that person treated with me with respect and gave me useful information. That's a much better perception than to look verbose. That's interesting. And I know we were heading towards um, <laughs> containing this this little piece, but I just what you just said there reminded me of something that came up. Uh, at the time of recording, you and I had just delivered one of our planning sessions, and there was a bit towards the end we were talking about uh, a not-for-profit uh, reaching out to get support and input from an important stakeholder. And you were making the point that if you're going to have this communication, make sure you give this stakeholder what they need in your communication so that they can make their decisions. Don't leave the door open for them to have to come back to burden you down with more questions. But at the same time, don't give them the easy out of delaying this because they can easily say, oh, can you please clarify what you mean by X? Does it was In a Venn diagram, where does that intersect with Josh Burnoff's writing without BS? I think this is stuff that Josh is very aware of, and that is if you can give people what's going on, what they need to know, but also what you think a good response would be without applying pressure. And that would be Josh's big point here, is don't try and pressurize people or they will immediately reject what you're saying, even if it was going well until that point. So if you've got an issue you need to explain to someone and you think there's a best response, tell them that you think here is one alternative that might be a very good response. Uh, Please to hear if you have other suggestions or if you would like to take action immediately but give people what they need so all they have to do is say yes or no. You don't want them to have to go and waste a day and a half thinking and then an hour writing back to you if you can make it a yes or no decision for them. So I actually I love this. This just cuts to the heart of, well, mm. it's my DNA. We don't want to put pressure on people. We need to also respect their ability to know that a decision is to be made mm. and leave the ball in their court once you've given them what they need, what they need. from your yep. perspective. Yeah, I suppose we might call that the sting principle. Uh, if you love someone, set them free. And if they decide to return to you, David, then happiness evolves. And if they don't, then at least they're not feeling pressured and uh, antagonistic towards you. No, because if people keep writing and keep adding that pressure and antagonism, there's not a faster way to have people you know, stop opening your emails. Mm. Which reminds me, an email will be going out to let people know when this episode uh, comes out. I'll just have to be mindful of the adjective count. So is he, uh, 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 one last thing, is he pre- um, suggesting sort of a pritikin diet of uh, really prickly, uh, bare necessity, roughage and oats and not as much floweriness? For him, floweriness is when you're writing to construct a beautiful image rather than to get information across that people need right now. So he sees it as two very different types of writing. So if people need the information now to make an important decision, give them what they need to save them time. If you're trying to lay out a new idea or something that could be very interesting, you know, fine, later on in the email or the piece of writing, you really paint the picture but after they've got the basics they need. So really, you, you've given them the core, and now you want them to have an expansive worldview, but don't give them the expansive worldview first. Hmm. I'd like to re reassemble a few um, of the older musicals this way, 
Because when I first watched musicals, I had to wait through the songs, you know, Oklahoma, mm -hmm. just get the song over with. I want the story to continue. So if Josh Burnoff was writing musicals of the 1940s, he would have done all the story in the first act, and then you can just watch the songs if you want to. Well, I would use the classic example of the Blues Brothers where they enter the diner uh, and Aretha Franklin, after about four lines of dialogue, bursts into singing respect. You know that she is the slighted lady that's tried to look after you know, the people in her life and now this guy is disappearing out of the diner with his musical instrument case to rejoin the band and she's not real happy. But it unfolds so quickly, you know why the song's happening immediately. So I think that's the kind of musical theatre Josh Burnoff would probably approve of. And in full circle, theatrical style, it brings us right back to the respect for the person we're communicating with. Thanks, Dave. Exactly. Our four Ps. Number three, problems. I asked the question for the best reason possible. Simple curiosity. Oscar Wilde. For this episode, we've gone into the mailbag and a client of ours, Simon, uh, from Perth, uh, flicked a copy of an email that he'd been sent by his uh, web hosting company. And it said, uh, hi, Simon, this is a courtesy email to advise that someone, in brackets, quite possibly yourself, has updated your VIP control account details. If it was not you, we suggest you log in to your VIP control account immediately and update your account information and password to prevent unauthorized access. Now, this is yet another one of these, you know, robotic messages that get sent out in good faith. Um, what I don't like is the fact that this email came with a link to reset the VIP control account. I really think this is the era where we shouldn't have those links coming because it sets up that a, a spoofer could easily copy this email and just change that link. You know, I'd much rather see the wording say, you know, you go back to our website where your, our, your hosting account is, log in afresh and update it from there, just as a bit of a, a caution. However, I wanted to share this email with you because I think what Simon did is the model to follow. He has a trusted uh, advisor in his life. In that case, it's us. And instead of moving forward and doing anything in the email, he took you know, three milliseconds to hit forward to ask, is this legitimate? What should I do? And I think, sadly, we're in this era where there are so many fake emails flowing around and emails that look absolutely spot on it's really hard to pick the fakes most of the times these days and so having that trusted advisor who's been around the block a few times um, is worth its weight in gold just a really helpful habit uh, to have david your thoughts exactly what you said plus one little thing on a lot of spoof emails like that if you hit the reply button you can then see the real email it came from and that's one of the only giveaways sometimes of how dodgy what you just got can be. So hit the reply button, not to reply, but to see what email pops up. And that will often be your first cue or clue as to whether it's legit or not legit. Yeah, but sadly, we're in an era of assume a suspicious stance. Yeah, start suspicious and, and grain you know, credibility back through research. Yeah. Anyway, so look, um, whether it's us or whether it's your own person that you have, please make use of them. I'm sure, like us, they don't charge for that quick little uh, look because I'd much rather the ultimate safety of the people we work with than you know niggling away at billing for one and a half minutes work. It's just, it's, it's I suppose, right, right back to our first episode, uh, first segment today, it is part of our mission. So uh, please make use of a trusted person around you. And uh, having said that, trust no one, especially if it's an email that's asking you to log in. I think that's the real giveaway. Yeah. Our four Ps. Number four, perspicacity. The one duty we owe to history is to rewrite it. 
Oscar Wilde. For the perspicacity segment in this episode, we are going to, well, how do I say this, David? Reveal a bit of my past that made me the butt of jokes for a long time. It was when I owned and proudly drove a Volvo. And this came about before our lives had crossed. It was 2008. I had a different car. My first daughter was about to be born you know, within about two weeks, three weeks' time. And we're sitting with friends, and they told me uh, in Melbourne they, they had a Volvo. And one night, uh, my friend was driving across the, the Westgate Bridge, I think it's called. Westgate, I think. Yeah. And it was rainy night, dark, and this car crossed over and headed right towards him. And he felt a small bump and looked behind, and this other car had crashed into the guardrails just behind him. So he stopped to render assistance uh, and was shocked when he saw just how much of his Volvo had been collapsed in. But he felt nothing. And I remember, I can picture this meeting. At that point, I made the decision and within one week I had traded in my other car for a Volvo so that I could take the highest responsibility for my little bundle of joy who was coming. David, what was I falling victim to? I don't think you were falling victim. I think the really the critical thing here to talk about is would we ever want to advertise anything only for a single good feature? So at the time of the adverts that were going at the time you bought the car, it was where we had the crash test dummies and they would wonderfully go, Hello <laughs> and we we would find out where they had all their accelerometers and then we would be told how safe Volvo was. Now that was absolutely true. But in real terms, that was diminishing everything else that was good about the product. Because I wasn't aware of anything else about the product. I was actually no. surprised that the car I bought looked good. I didn't it actually was a good car on top of the safety. Yeah. <laughs> and and it did. I love being the butt of jokes. And so in uh, in workshops where we looked at different car makers and we got people's reactions when Volvo came up, everyone would say, "Oh, you know, someone who plays lawn bowls, uh, conservative, uh, wears a cardigan, uh, etc." And that was all part, I think, part and parcel of that one track mode. In fact, yeah. you mentioned the crash test dummies. Can we just have a listen to? I think this was an amazing seven or eight minute video that Volvo put out, in which it was a documentary of a day in the life of their senior crash test dummy. Um, Clive? Oh, baby! What a crash! Looking good! The door opens just as it should. What a showman he is, and at his age. Well, that felt great, but how did it go? Barrier test, S80, 65 kilometers an hour. Driver, you're completely okay. Yeah! Clive, alive! I knew it, even if the safety belt was tough. And the airbag! Too hard to break. And think he's still single. Well, the job is number one for him. <laughs> down, down, down. I, I, I really think they were on a good thing, weren't they? I think they were on a good thing, but it's like any good thing. If it diminishes all the other good bits so much and makes you a one-trick pony. It's never a good thing to be a one-trick pony. They were building very good vehicles that were very good in difficult terrain, very good on icy roads, clever engineering, built in ethical factories, built by people owning fair wages who could live good lives. There was so much more here to package and explain than, hello. <laughs> so if we apply our perspicacity here, where we sharpen up our thinking by reflecting upon something, I think everyone's aware of the crash test dummies and the various safety messages of the Volvo ads. Here we are now at the time of recording, 2022, just about every car on the planet has subsumed those 
safety elements. And, and they become this is, normal. Mm, and this is what you're alluding to here for this exercise is when you dominate with one of your benefits, uh, it's got to be a mighty good one that will last forever, yep. and which is which is very unlikely. Very unlikely. And it also means that as time goes on and you have to scramble to redo your marketing, people will go, oh, well, they don't do their old marketing anymore. Why not? Don't they do safety anymore? So there's actually a risk that people get so used to the, the single message that if you stop doing it, they then question whether you are still legitimate and focused on that thing that had made you recognizable, when all you're doing is adapting to the fact that that thing is no longer unique. So really, you've got to view whatever you do as the overall package is unique. How enthusiastic you are about turning up every day. How good the product is. How good the service is. How good the follow-up support is what you try and do for your employees, how you fit in your community. You don't have to do all of these, but try and do as many as you can legitimately in different parts of your website and in different aspects of your marketing. Yes, because Volvo on my horizon is fairly invisible at the moment. Uh, I don't consume a lot of commercial media, but I, they don't seem to have a dominant uh, place on the media landscape. And... I was just trying to think what I would do if I was in the driving seat at Volvo with some of the smart stuff they could and probably are doing. You almost wonder if there's – you don't want to lose and sever your legacy of safety because you're dead right. You don't want someone to think, oh, hang on, have they dropped the safety ball? You almost want to lead with a, a message that connects with whatever the, the, the burning need of the day is in the car market – that you're able to to meet, and hopefully there's something unique there, but almost with, oh, all that, and it's safe too. You're, you're like a backup tagline yep. to tip a hat to the past, uh, yep. uh, but leading with something that is what I care about now. So my suggestion would be, seeing they've become so much more focused on high performance and luxury, to much you know more go down the line of, it looks this good, it goes this well, and it's still just as safe. Mm. Would you have the crash test dummies now wearing Prada and carrying Gucci handbags around and living the good life but still checking in to, to go to work? I would more likely have you know, a young couple like you were bringing your first baby home because that's a much more credible safety argument you know, than the goofy dummy. <laughs> yes, I like how you said a young couple like I we were. Thanks for that. Um, well, you you are slightly older now, seeing your children actually yeah. can organise their own day. So yeah, so the latest model was probably uh, Instagrammably safe, so you yeah. can take the social media candy but get home safely. Because I tell you what, this was the insight. I've never felt as nervous as when the first put Alexandra into the car to leave hospital. And it was just me, Nadia, and Alexandra and the world. And that's where that safety really came to a fore. So it's still got that that leg. It's still got that same cachet. We just need to do it in an integrated way. Yeah. There you go. A little bit of a perspicacious pondering to finish off this episode. David, thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for listening. Of course, we're available podcast at talkedaboutmarketing.com if you'd like to be in touch with us. But Caitlin's going to reinforce those details right now. See you again in a fortnight. Thank you for listening to Talking About Marketing. If you enjoyed it, please leave a rating or a review in your favorite podcast app. And if you found it helpful, please share it with others. Steve and David always welcome your comments and questions so send them to podcast at talkedaboutmarketing.com. And finally, the last word to Oscar Wilde. There's only one thing worse than being talked about, and that's not being talked about. Hi, Jeremy Cordo in the Court of Public Opinion. 
I'm just on air here to let you know that we'll be live streaming the Court of Public Opinion every Friday between 9 o'clock and 12 on jeremycordo.com. Please join us. We'd love to have you.